Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from around the world. Uh, you are highly welcome uh, to this program. As I've been consistently saying, I'm extremely grateful to those of you uh, who have been contributing to the show, uh, who have been part of us, uh, who have been watching uh, every time. Uh, we appreciate uh, your commitment to the program, and we appreciate your involvement uh, in uh, helping to figure out how we can move forward as a country. As I keep on saying, uh, this program that we are doing is not just simply uh, a one-way traffic where I, as an individual, uh, is lecturing to you. But this is really a conversation, uh, a conversation that I believe involves uh, all of us so that we, together as citizens of South Sudan, uh, can have a deeper understanding of the problems that we have, uh, uh, and then how do we move forward. Uh, and these problems, we need to also look at them from the historical roots. Uh, we analyze them as a problem in general, and then we also look at the, uh, the, the, the functionaries, the, the individuals who are involved in those problems, and uh, getting this problem to be a national problem. Uh, so I appreciate uh, those of you who join, and then who also uh, share your comments and your views. Uh, let me start by saying I really apologize for being late. We are one hour late uh, today. And uh, it's a weekend, it's Saturday here in America. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening uh, on weekends. Uh, so my apologies. We had a bit also of technical uh, problem with the internet. Uh, so uh, uh, we had to fix it. Uh, and that is one of the things that also uh, took time. Uh, so my apologies. And uh, thank you for those of you who waited uh, patiently to tune in. Uh, and uh, uh, those of you who uh, could not wait and who have uh, left, uh, I hope that uh, you will be able to watch the show uh, at the later time, at the, at the time of your convenience. Uh, so uh, thank you for those of you who have joined us, uh, and I welcome everyone. Uh, let me say, uh, please uh, share the video uh, so that the people of South Sudan can, uh, can also have access uh, to this program and to be able to see uh, everything that we are talking about. Uh, and I encourage those of you who have been debating this issue, I hear that... Uh, all over the country, uh, including in Juba and several uh, cities, people are talking about our program and what we have been doing here. Uh, we appreciate that and we really encourage that because we want the people of South Sudan to have a conversation. That is the only way we can move forward. And sometimes uh, these conversations can be quite intense as, they ha as, as it has been the case in uh, several WhatsApp group. Uh, and uh, that is okay, uh, especially in a country like ours where we are trying to build a culture of tolerance, of disagreement, of building thick skin. Uh, that is very important for all of us because uh, we don't need to take any of these issues uh, personally. Uh, these are national issues. Uh, the issues of character, of leaders, uh, these are important. Uh, you know, character is extremely important in leadership, especially in an environment where institutions do not exist. It's really what individuals do and the choices that they make that ultimately lead to the development of institutions. Uh, so when we talk about uh, weakness in the characters of uh, individuals, uh, whether they are leaders or whatever, uh, it's not because we are against them or we hate them. It's because we want to point out why those individuals are unfit uh, for public leadership uh, and why it is important for South Sudanese people to figure out how best they can move forward with leaders that care about them. Uh, so I hope you people understand and I know a lot of people have been attacking me. They have been uh, saying all kinds of things for me. And they absolutely have the right to do that. In fact, I will be the first to defend your right to speak your mind. Uh, because you should have a right uh, to speak your mind. And if you believe that there is a ways in which I am not conducting myself well, that should be pointed out. Uh, so I appreciate that. I read the comments. I try to learn from some of the comments that I, that I read. I try to adjust. Uh, the programs, and I hope this is the same thing for all the other leaders in the country, that when people criticize you, instead of attacking those individuals or arresting them or assassinating them, as it has been the case in South Sudan, you should listen uh, to these people and see what can you learn from them? How can you do your things better? Because that is the only way in which we could correct each other, is through criticism, positive criticism. Sometimes it may appear uh, as if it is negative, but if we listen and we calm down ourselves, uh, we can find some truth in it. So please, 
continue. Those of you who are criticizing me, you have every right to do that. I encourage you to continue to do that. Those of you who like what we are saying and who are encouraging it, uh, we also encourage you to do the same thing. I know there are individuals that have been making their own videos. That is excellent. I really appreciate that, and I encourage you to do that. Those of you who are talking about this at the T places, that is fantastic. That is what we want. We want you to discuss. And when you discuss, don't leave those discussions hanging. Come back to the conclusion and figure out what then is the way forward. How do we move forward? Uh, so uh, this is uh, what I want to say. Now, as today, before we get into our program, last week, uh, you all know what happened. Uh, the wounded heroes of South Sudan, uh, who were uh, demanding their dues, uh, medical allowances as well as their salaries, and went to the Ministry of Finance and staged a protest, uh, you remember how much they were br brutalized. These were people that were wounded uh, in the service of South Sudan, in the process of liberating the Republic of South Sudan. And when they came uh, to the Ministry of Finance to demand their dues, they were shot again, and some of them were wounded again uh, for the second time. Uh, and this time by the government that they have supported. This was absolutely tragic and is an issue that we extremely condemn. But what really shocked us uh, after this incident was not just the incident itself, but how the Minister of Finance uh, talked about it. Uh, Dr. Bach, uh, Dr. Bach came out with a statement where he called some of these wounded, uh, uh, wound, wounded heroes uh, self, uh, self claim uh, wounded heroes. Uh, this was a very unfortunate statement. Uh, it was extremely unfortunate because, uh, you know, the issue here is whether these people are wounded and whether the people are, are heroes. And I don't think any one of us is denying that. Uh, they are wounded. Uh, you know, that is obvious. Uh, and they are heroes because uh, Dr. Bach, although he was in the intelligence services, uh, did not uh, go to the front line and was wounded like these people. Uh, so it's demeaning. Uh, to undermine their service to the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, Dr. Bach, instead of coming to the press later and talking to the press, he should have just gone to them. You know, they're fellow South Sudanese, they're reasonable people, he should have come before them. Was he afraid that they would shoot him? Why would they shoot him? They're looking for their dues. He should have gone there and talked to them uh, and tell them something that is reasonable, uh, but to come later on to the media and call them self-proclaimed uh, this is absolutely unbecoming. Uh, they, can, they are not self-proclaimed uh, uh, wounded heroes. They are real wound, wounded heroes of South Sudan. And they were wounded in the service of the nation. Uh, and I, I want all the veterans in the country to really look at this incident and think about what does this mean. This is how the high senior official in the government of Salvakir think about them. They, they, call, the, they call them self-proclaimed wounded heroes. They call them self-proclaimed. These are individuals that are stealing the resources of the country, left and right. They're diverting the resources of the country to Benjamin Bol Mill and to President Kier. And they're leaving the people who have brought this country into existence. They're leaving them with nothing. They're leaving their families with nothing. And then when these people raise their voices to complain and to demand their rights, these people are treated as if they are savages and then they are called self-proclaimed wounded heroes. This is absolutely unfortunate. And I want all the veterans in the country to understand. The reason that many of us have been against Salva Kiir is because he has truly forgotten how this country came into existence. He has forgotten the sacrifices of so many brave men and women, those who died liberate, liberating the country. If you look now on the streets of Juba, most of those uh, street, street children, these are children of the veterans. You know, the parents are not there. And the parents are not there because they went for cattle wrestling or intercommunal violence that are now being promoted by President Kiir and his cronies in J1. They died because they were fighting against the enemy of South Sudan so that they can liberate the Republic of South Sudan, so that people of South Sudan can demand, can dream of a better future. But here today, their kids are homeless, they're on the streets, they're in the gangs, they are the one being, 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 being looked down and being crushed. And their parents are the reason why this oil that now is being uh, consumed by a very few individuals, uh, this is why we have that oil. This is why we have this beautiful country that is called the Republic of South Sudan. And then the colleagues who have survived, 
but we have survived with wounds in their bodies, who have lost legs, who have lost arms, who have been shot in all manner of parts of the body. When they come and they ask for their dues, they are shot, and not only after they are shot, they are called self-proclaimed. If they are self-proclaimed, how did two million people die? Were those people who died also self-proclaimed, or did they die? And if two million could die in the process of fighting, how many more million did you think were wounded? You know, we have to show empathy to our people. And Kiir's regime, just through this single act, has shown that it doesn't care about anyone. It doesn't care about whatever sacrifice that you have done to this country. And this is absolutely unfortunate. And it's one of the reasons why I've been saying that we need to get rid of this regime and bring into power a government that will care about the people of South Sudan, a government that will respect the sacrifices of the South Sudanese people, and a government that will work for the interests of South Sudanese people. I extremely condemn uh, Bak. I know that he will not apologize. I know that he will not resign, because in his mind, uh, he doesn't care what the people of South Sudan think. He's only loyal to Salbakir. What matters to him is what Salbakir thinks. And as long as he's giving money to Bolmen and to Salbakir, and not paying salaries. Imagine, he has been a, since he was appointed as minister, he has not managed to pay a single salary uh, to uh, civil servants or to the military. But the money is going to J1. The money is going to the personal accounts of Salva Kir. The money is going to Bol Mil. Every single money is going there, millions and millions of dollars. And we will talk about that. You know, this is absolutely unfortunate. But people of South Sudan are the ultimate authority in this country. This country is ours. This country was not brought about because Salva Kiir was there. It was brought about because there were men and women that were willing to go to the front line and to die for the Republic of South Sudan. And they did. And there were also men and women that were willing to go to the front line. And they were wounded. And they are heroes. They are not self-proclaimed. They are real heroes. They are real wounded heroes of South Sudan. And every South Sudanese citizen, whether you agree with the government or you disagree with the government, we should always agree on one thing. We must honor our veterans. We must honor those who did what we could not do, those who sacrificed their lives, those who answered the call of duty and went to the front line and fight for this country. That should be a common denominator that unites us all, regardless of your politics, regardless of your tribes, regardless of your region. There is no way whatsoever we can allow or make it normal for those who sacrifice themselves for this country to be treated as if they are uh, worthless. And that is what Bak did, and it's extremely unfortunate. I call on every South Sudanese person, whether you are inside the country or you are outside, to condemn this act and to stand in solidarity with our wounded heroes. They are the heroes of South Sudan. We are proud of them, and although our country is not treating them the right way, I believe time is coming when a government that can give them the right due, that can treat them with the respect that they deserve, will come into existence. And that government will always honor them, will honor the children whose fathers are dead, whose mothers are dead. It will also honor the widows who have lost their husband and give them a life that they can be proud of and in which they will be thankful for the sacrifices that their loved ones have made. I wanted to make sure that I, I state that before we move uh, into our program. Now, for those of you who have been following this program, uh, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, we have been discussing uh, the book of Tim Edwards. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the blood, A Bloody Nile uh, by Tim Edwards. Uh, many of you have been reading it. You have been commenting on it. Uh, I have been summarizing it and going through it chapter by chapter. Uh, last week, we, cupped, we, uh, we covered chapter 1 to chapter 6. Uh, this today we are going to focus on chapter seven to chapter ten, and uh, and 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 I want all of you, uh, as I keep saying, I encourage all of you to read this book at your own time. Obviously, tune into this program. We'll do our best uh, to summarize it and to capture what is uh, what is there as uh, uh, as uh, adequately as we can. But it is better that you, on your own, are able to read this book and then to truly understand what is going on. Obviously, it's not a Bible. Uh, it was written by a man, uh, and it, what is in there is not a word of God. Uh, so there are things that you will find there that you may not like. But on, its a, on a whole, uh, this is a very important book, and it, it has a lot of sobering 
uh, information in there uh, that humble us, even those of us that are very proud of the SPLA, SPLM during the liberation uh, 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 days, not the SPLM and SPLM of today, but obviously the SPLM of that time. Even that time, there were a lot of things that were happening that many of us uh, were not willing to call out because we were focused on winning the war against the Jalaba. We were not interested so much on pointing out what was going wrong among ourselves, but we were focused on making sure that we succeed and we remove uh, the enemy that was, uh, uh, that was uh, suppressing our people. Uh, but now that we are an independent country and we are caught in this vicious cycle of violence, of oppressing our own people, it is important for us to take a step back and look, about, look at where did we come from and what is it within our struggle to be independent country, the struggle embedded within the, the journey of the SPLA. What are some of those things that we can look at and what are some of those things that, from which we can learn so that we as a people are able to reckon with our own uh, history. Uh, we cannot just gaslight it. There are terrible deeds that were done uh, within the SPLA, within the SPLM, against the people of South Sudan. And if we are not willing to call those things out, if we are not willing to call those things out, then we are not ready to have a genuine conversation and we are not ready for a true healing and reconciliation. Because although the SPLA, SPLM liberated the country, it also created a lot of mess within South Sudan. It turned, it created a lot of atrocities within South Sudan. And these are some of the things that we are going to talk about today. So if you look, you start from chapter seven. Uh, chapter seven is entitled SPLA Rwang Stratagem. And in this chapter, there are key issues that are, uh, that are addressed. Uh, first uh, is the, uh, the issue of uh, lack of organizational structures within the SPLA. Uh, lack of basic information, in, uh, including the number of the forces uh, you remember this war was a very long war. It took uh, many, many, many years uh, for this war to be brought to an end and for it to be won. And during that process, uh, fatigue of the war set in. A lot of people deserted. People went to refugee camps. Uh, people uh, found a settlement and went to the diaspora. Uh, so the information itself on what was the number of the troops uh, was problematic, uh, was truly problematic. Uh, so. Uh, my people, uh, we want to go through this and to understand. So one of the things that Tim Edwards talked about here was just even the lack of basic numbers. Even some of these units that were, uh, that were organized, this division that was stationed around the country, there was really no information on the true exact numbers of the men that were in there. And because of lack of that, especially after the signing of the CPA, when the first salaries were paid, without having the pay sheet, knowing exactly who is there, and then just releasing the money. This actually encouraged a big problem that has continued to affect South Sudan since that day. And this is the problem of ghost names, because now the commanders were given the money to pay people. And when they did the pay sheet, many of them added in uh, uh, the women, they added in like their wives, their girlfriends, they added in individuals, including people that do not exist. Ghost names, they were added in. Uh, and, and because of that, the pay sheet ballooned out of control. People were assuming numbers that were not there. And that money that was being released on a monthly basis was being pocketed by individuals who were handing out that, pay, uh, that, that, that payment. So commanders that were there in the, in the division became very rich because the money was now going into their pockets. People within the SPLA were now demanding to be made pay masters because they are the ones that are handing out those payments. And uh, they know that if there is a money that is left behind, is the paymaster and the commanders that are going to sit down and divide the money. This is how a lot of individuals within the SPLA were able to begin this problem that has continued to be a problem ever since. And when it was happening, the sad part about it was everybody knew that it was happening. Uh, it was not like it was a secret. But because so many commanders were doing the same thing everywhere, so no one was there to, tell the other, to call out the other person. So we just allowed this country uh, to, from the very beginning, to start on the wrong foot. Uh, this is uh, one of the elements that Tim Edwards uh, uh, talked about uh, in this chapter. Uh, the second issue that he talks about was the issue of nepotism. Uh, nepotism and tribalism and regionalism within the SPLA. And by the way, this problem has been there from the very beginning, from the very beginning of the movement since 1983. If you look, most of the division that came most of the headquarters of the senior commanders, most of the time, they were made up of people that come from their own areas. 
They were made in the people that come from the regions. Even with our own leader, John Garang, uh, God bless him, however great that we hold him up, even when you look at his own headquarters, aside from number of senior officials, predominantly most of the people that made up his uh, headquarters came from our area of Bor. So it was mostly Dinka Bor. The same thing if you look with Salva Kir. Most of the people that made up uh, his headquarters came from his region. The same thing with those of William Nguyen. The same thing with Riyak Macha. And that is why when a commander uh, defected, he defected with people from his tribe and with his sub-tribes. This was a very big prom problem from the very beginning. We didn't begin by building an integrated national army where uh, units were mixed ethnically and regionally and tribally uh, across South Sudan. This was always a problem. And, and, and over time, it became worse. And it, allowed, it prevented us as South Sudanese people uh, to really build coherent institutions that can be bedrock of a nation and a bedrock of a democracy. Uh, so this is a point that uh, uh, Tim Edward uh, mentioned. Another issue that you all uh, know, uh, in initially when the war started, there was a lot of excitement. A lot of people joined in large numbers uh, from across the region of South Sudan. You know, of, obviously, Tiger Temsa and, and Yamus, most of them came from the Nuer area in Upper Nile. They joined in large numbers. Uh, Koryom mostly came from uh, Bor area. Uh, and then if you look, for example, more and more, more and more largely came from Bar Ghazal. So people were extremely excited. Uh, they wanted to be part of the, uh, the struggle, and they joined uh, in, uh, in large numbers uh, to, to fight for what they, what they saw as uh, uh, independent South Sudan, or to fight for the independent Republic of South Sudan. But over time, as the fatigue of war set in, as South Sudanese turns against each other and start killing each other, that numbers of recruitment began to dwindle, And especially after the 1991, a lot of uh, 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 people defected with Riyak Machar. Uh, and then that defection became ethnically based uh, with the predominantly Dinka Torid faction headed by Garang and predominantly Nuer faction headed by Riyak Machar. So this uh, entrenched the problem of tribalism and it prevented uh, the, uh, the nationalism that was emerging within the SPLM. Uh, this is a real problem. And the consequence of that over time was that SPLA now began to rely more on conscription. Kacha. This is what we was called kacha uh, by then. You know, so people are uh, being forced to go and, and fight, uh, and, and, they, and they were taken uh, by force. We have to remember those things. Now, you can argue that the movement had no choice, and the only way that they could continue to fight the Jalaba was to do that. But what that did was it brought into the forces people that were not genuinely volunteers. You know, a disciplined army in the world is always made up of volunteers, people that are willing to serve the nation, people that are motivated by dedication to national service. But when people are they are conscripted and they are taken by force, you are bringing in people that are not willing and people that are not willing to do, uh, to, do, uh, to do things properly. So this is an issue that Tim Edwards talked about. Uh, and then, uh, on top of that, as I said, uh, the problem has always been the issue of uh, the exact numbers. There is a particular quote that I want to read here from Chapter 7, uh, where Tim Edwards talked about when the CPA was signed in 2005, the SPLA leadership did not know the exact numbers of its standing parade of forces. Uh, the true number of officers and men was vague. There had been desertions, defections, death, unknown relocation, those who sought asylum in refugee camps in neighboring countries. Then many others joined the numerous UN agencies and NGOs, while others simply returned to their homes to farm the land and or look after their cattle. Uh, whatever way one chose to look at it, SPLA was fighting a war of attrition against several elements, including itself. And this became particularly the case, especially over time, uh, when, you, uh, when you look at uh, the additional problem that came in later on uh, through warlordism, uh, when some forces that rely exclusively from recruitment from their local areas began to really show serious problem of discipline uh, within the, the SPLA. So this, this is uh, what you find in chapter, in chapter 7. Uh, it's a very uh, important chapter because we are talking now about the structural issues of the SPLA that made it possible for the war in 2013 and for that uh, 
attack on the Nuer civil population where people went door to door to kill them, men, women, and children. It was because we never built a professional military. And the problem of that dates back to the days when the movement was founded. Um, so that is uh, chapter, chapter 7. Now, the other thing that he, he talks about in this chapter, which I, I, I need to also stress, was the abuses of civilians, uh, especially in the Equatorial region. Uh, in the book, uh, there is a talk about the atrocities that the SPLA had committed uh, when we were turning against our own people, uh, robbing them uh, of their uh, the goods. Uh, everywhere, even in Bar Ghazal, even in Upper Nile, uh, soldiers were coming and they will say they want to take your goods or they want to take your cows. And sometimes they will just use violence and they will shoot at your cattle and they seize them. Uh, sometimes they were polite. Uh, you know, you remember the whole doctrine that John Grang said that uh, when you find a civilian and he has his food, uh, don't rob him, but don't let him refuse to give it to you. you know, so it, it was very vague and it was left there in the middle. And most of the time what this did, did, did it was to encourage uh, this army that was supposedly liberating the people of South Sudan to also become uh, as a, a, a oppressive uh, force against the people of South Sudan. Uh, so bo the books there detail some of the excesses of the SPLA, particularly in the Equatorial region, where uh, some of the soldiers uh, were engaging in arbitrary killings, they were raping women, they were taking properties, uh, and uh, all kinds of, all manner of things that were happening. Uh, and then uh, the book also talks about the problem of inst instilling discipline uh, within the movement. Uh, the discipline was always a problem. And, uh, and, and this issue of discipline uh, made it difficult then for those within the forces to be afraid of being held accountable. Uh, one of the things that is hinted at, and it was not, uh, not discussed in detail, but those of you who were in the bush remember, uh, you remember there was a prominent Didinga uh, chief, uh, uh, Joseph Nakua, uh, who was, uh, was killed, was murdered uh, by uh, some of the bodyguards of President Kier uh, directly. And uh, the guy was shot and killed. And then the person who shot the guy was facilitated to return back to uh, the village in Akun. Uh, and this person was never held accountable. So there's all kinds of things like that that happen where uh, soldiers were misbehaving and they couldn't be held accountable. And this was particularly notorious with certain commanders. There were some commanders that tried to uh, apply uh, law and order, but there were others uh, that did not. And one of the people that is mentioned here in the book that was uh, trying his best to build a, a competent organized force was actually Thomas Cirillo. Uh, many of you may have different feelings about him now, uh, but back then uh, he did his best, especially with the New Sudan Brigade. Uh, there were a number of soldiers that worked very hard and tried very hard to build professional forces. But there were a number of commanders that were known, were famous for brutality, and especially within the headquarters of President Kiel, where there was completely relaxed atmosphere in terms of actually holding people accountable. And this became a problem later on, because this is a culture that President Kiel encouraged while in the book. His bodyguards could do whatever the hell they want. They could kill, like the prominent, the paramount chief of the Dinka was shot. President Kiel was aware of it, and he was likely complicit in uh, facilitating the exit of this gentleman that was responsible for this murder. Uh, so problems like that became more and more problematic uh, over, over time. And as I mentioned, Tim Edwards talked about the issue of warlordism that became even more problematic within the SPLA with certain commanders relying on forces from their own areas, from their own communities, from their own tribes. Uh, and then when, when they committed uh, excesses, whether they engaged in atrocities or murder, or they had uh, usurped food or products from people, if the leadership tried to hold them accountable, they threatened to defect. You know? So, and that became a problem in terms of holding people accountable. Uh, and over time, uh, this issue of discipline became a real problem. Uh, this really uh, became one of the debilitating diseases within the SPLA that became more and more problematic over time. So that is chapter seven, a uh, very, very important chapter. It uh, really provides us uh, a lot of uh, structural uh, problem uh, within the movement and uh, how they have been allowed to fester out of control. Uh, now the chapter ends there with like, okay, if this force was this indiscipline, how did it win? Well, it won because the people of South Sudan uh, were, uh, were loyal uh, to the cause of the SPLM. Although they were not necessarily agreeing with the tactics that were being used on a daily basis, uh, they, 
uh, they believe in the grand objective of what the SPLM was fighting for. Although there were problems here and there, they were more interested on the objective. And then SPLM, by, especially after the 19, 1991 split, and then later on with the recovery, SPLM, and it's, it's through the personal relationship of Dr. John, was able to bring on board external parties that helped it and that provided with the support that sustained the movement and allow it to recover and became a formidable force, particularly the United States of America, uh, that recruited the so-called frontline states of Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, and Uganda, and provided arms uh, through these states to support the SPLA and so that the SPLA could recover. So these relations were able to augment the efforts of the movement, and that allowed the movement to continue to fight and therefore uh, able to succeed in championing uh, the cause of the people of South Sudan. Okay, now chapter eight, chapter eight really focuses more uh, on, the, is, the title is there, is the, an attempt at reorganizing the SPLA. So the focus here is after the CPA has been signed, and then now people have come to Juba, and the idea now is to try to build a professional army. Don't forget, the SPLA was built as the guarantee of the, P of the CPA. It was the, it, was, it was the force that was to be used to actually uh, guarantee uh, the implementation of the CPA agreement. Uh, and to do that, it required being reorganized, it required being built into a competent, uh, professional military. Now, before Garang died, as we mentioned in the last episode, uh, one of the, uh, the last acts that he did was the appointment of the command of the military. This was the appointment of General Oya Denga Jack uh, as the chief of general staff, deputized uh, by uh, four deputies. Uh, you had Salvo Matung Gang, uh, you have James Hot Mai, you have Bura Jang Duot, and then you have uh, Isaac Mahamur Obote. Uh, these were the, uh, the, the, the four deputies that were appointed under him. And the main job were now to work with President Kier in uh, reorganizing the movement, trying to understand the true parade, and then to come uh, into, and, and then try to retrain it, instill a doctrine of a military that is uh, now consistent with the, uh, the, with the mission and uh, mandate of the armed forces all around the world. Now here, this thing fell flatly. Uh, the, this thing completely did not succeed. Uh, first of all, there was the first issue was the integration of the militias, uh, the SSDF, the Southern Sudan uh, Defense Forces, uh, of uh, uh, Polino Matip. Uh, these forces, as I mentioned in, in the last previous episode, and for those of you uh, who want to dig deeper into this, you can read my thesis. It's available online. Uh, I, I, I focus there, uh, especially on how the SPLA has always failed to become a professional military. And part of the problem actually dates back to the 2004 crisis in Ye. Uh, as I mentioned, when Salva Kiir was planning to defect from the SPLA, he was uh, in contact uh, with the Sudan uh, uh, military intelligence. Uh, this is the Sudan uh, Armed Forces uh, military intelligence of Khartoum. Uh, they were talking about uh, providing him with logistics, with uh, ammunition, with guns, uh, and then they, con they, they connected him uh, to the militias, uh, southern militias that were on their payroll, uh, especially the militias of Polino Matip, uh, the militias uh, of uh, Wani Konga that were based in Juba, uh, and, uh, militias, uh, and, and, and militias of uh, Ismail Konyi uh, that were based in the Murula area of Jongle. These uh, were realities. So later on when Ngarang died and now Salva Kiir came in, his former allies, you remember when he, uh, when he went to Khartoum to be sworn in, among the people that went to the airport to pick him up were Paulina Matip. This was a guy that were threatening just a few weeks before that the uh, flag of the SPLA would not be raised in Bentiu. Uh, but now his ally was the one in there. So when Salva Kiir finally was sworn in and he has taken the reins of powers, one of the things that he did was to make sure that the SSDF was uh, integrated. Now what is funny is that if you look at the record of the Sudan military intelligence, uh, this whole uh, force, this whole force of SSDF initially had only 15,000. 15,000, that was the total number. But in the end, the actual numbers that were integrated was more than 50,000. What happened? Well, there was a deliberate objective because Salva Kiir was always afraid of the force that he inherited from John Garang uh, because he, he feared that this force uh, was not truly loyal to him. It was loyal to the so-called Garang boys, especially those of Oyai Dengajak, and that these people could overthrow him at any time. So what he did 
you know, was to try to bring into the SPLA a force that he will consider to be loyal to him. And since Matip, Wani Konga, Ismail Konyi had been part of his collaborators during the whole Ye saga, now they were his allies and he welcomed them to bring as many forces into the movement, uh, into the military as much as possible. And then the forces came top heavy. In fact, after the integration, the major generals that came with the militias were more than the major generals that were in the SPLA. And everyone was officer. There was all these officers, and these officers did not actually have uh, soldiers. Foot soldiers were missing. So this added another uh, complication uh, to the movement. And it made it very difficult to professionalize the military. So that was one factor. The second factor was the lack of trust uh, between uh, Salva Kiir on the one hand and We Ai Denga Jack on the other. Pretty much every month, there was rumor that, uh, uh, that uh, We Ai was doing a coup. And in fact, uh, the, the, the rumors were that We Ai will usurp power and then he will hand it over uh, to Nyandeng Dit, to Mama Rebecca Nyandeng, the widow of John Grang. That was the rumor that was uh, created. And this was actually a deliberate uh, uh, effort to fight those who were seen as Garang boys or loyal to Garang boys. Uh, you remember among the people that became victim early on was Nyal Deng Nyal. Uh, Nyal Deng Nyal was uh, completely mistreated. He was savagely uh, uh, undermined in his efforts until he had to resign and uh, return to London. Uh, and this was the same thing that was being done to those of Pagana movement to everyone. Uh, this was a deliberate uh, effort. In fact, one of the generals, one of the uh, ministers at the time, uh, that was very close to Salva Kiir, told me recently that actually it was an order from Salva Kiir to his inner circle that they must fight the Garang boys. Uh, so that is what was happening. So all these things were undermining the effort. Uh, there is a, 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 a paragraph that I need to read to you here uh, just to show you. Uh, some of, because sometimes uh, Salva Kiir will tell Oyai to do things that are unprofessional. And then Oyai uh, would try to find his way not to do them. And when he doesn't do them, it will be labeled as uh, undermining him. And people will say, look, this is what he used to do in the bush. He used to undermine you and work di directly with Garang. He's doing the same thing now. He's undermining you. Uh, this is a telling uh, paragraph. Uh, it's saying... Uh, uh, these efforts to, organ to reorganize the SPLA were being further complicated and frustrated by her own senior uh, leaders. President Kiir sent a list that included the sons of a politician and a bishop to the chief of general staff for absorption in the army as officers without basic training, leave alone prior rudimental military experience. A third gentleman on the same list who had been a postmaster for an online newspaper in Nairobi was to be expressly promoted from civilian to captain. Oyai Dengajak disregarded the president, the commander-in-chief's instruction, and gave them all provisional cadet ranks as second lieutenant until such a time when they underwent formal training. The president took this as another slide from his army chief of general staff. These were the things that were directly undermining the ability of the military to professionalize itself and build a professional army. And they were coming directly from the president. The president was the one that was championing uh, these things. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we, when we, when we, every time we talk about the failure of leadership is because of those things. There was inability of the president here to uh, elevate himself and see himself as a national leader and think about how can he build a strong organization in the form of professional military that will help, uh, that will serve the people of South Sudan professionally. Uh, now, there is an account here of this whole situation uh, that was written uh, in one of the diplomatic cables uh, by the political affairs officer of the U.S. Embassy. Uh, and this was a report that this particular uh, political officer made to Washington, D.C. about the inner workings of the SPLA and what was happening between Salva Kiir and Oyai Dengaja. Uh, this is a very fascinating part, and I like those of you who read the book, you, you can go to it. Now, it say, so the political, the political officer at the then United States Consulate in Juba will report to his bosses thus, this is the quote, 
The relationship between Ghost President Salva Kiir and SPLA Chief of Staff Oyai Deng is clearly very troubled. Though Deng provided only one side of the story, what he say is obviously disturbing. The SPLA is the bedrock of Ghost authority. The SPLA senior command is currently riven with suspicion and mistrust, and rivalries inside the army echo the ethnic and political divisions of the larger society. The ultimate responsibility for correcting this problem and forging a professional, inclusive, and royal army rests with Salva Kiir. We hope he is up to the task. End quote. And the sad part was that Salva Kiir was not up to the task. That is why the SPLA never professionalized. And that's why in 2013 he had to recruit an entirely private militia, predominantly from his home area of Warab, have Paul Malone train them, and then brought them to Juba so that they can commit atrocities. This is exactly that, that lack of leadership. And this is what Junubin have been complaining about, that the president is not, is not up to the task of building institutions, building uh, competent institutions that can discharge authority uh, in the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, so uh, the issue of suspicion uh, made it very difficult uh, for, for this thing to happen. Uh, now, uh, not just beyond the army, they were building other organized forces, the police, the wildlife, the prison services, you know. And what happened was this, the soldiers from the army or those who were integrated were then simply seconded to these other forces. And you know very well the role of the police and the role of the prison services are very different from the role of the military. So now they were, they were seconding all people, uh, people that were wounded, people that were no longer deemed as effective to be in the army, to be taken to the police, forgetting that the role of the police is by far more important than the role of the army, because the police is the one that actually implement uh, uh, the rule of law in the country. And you want them to be effective and to be professional. So that disorganization within the SPLA, that whole lack of professionalism was simply taken to other institutions within the government. And also it was within the SP, from the SPLA that people were recommended to the civil service. There were civil service that were found within the government control areas. Those were called the, the, uh, the, coordinating, the coordinating authority, uh, the coordinating council of uh, southern Sudan. And then there was the civil service that came from the liberated areas that was called the civil authority of New Sudan. And the civil authority of New Sudan obviously uh, came through the main SPLA, both of which have people that were completely unqualified and unready to provide services. So the dysfunctions that were just here in the army became embedded in the overall government, which prevented the ability of the government to deliver. And then we have a leader that had no vision, have no capacity whatsoever to manage all of this and to build a coherent, professional institution that could take South Sudan forward. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, what you found uh, in Chapter 8. Now, Chapter 9, this is a very fascinating story, is uh, on how the Air Force, the brand new Air Force of South Sudan was built. And in this chapter, you find exactly the same problem, the, pro the same problem of nepotism, uh, the same problem of disorganization, of indiscipline. Uh, there is a very fascinating passage here uh, in the first uh, page of, the, of that chapter where a certain general uh, came in to the guy who has been tasked with the recruitment of uh, people that would be, would be taken to be trained in Ethiopia as pilots. So this particular general, you know, came in uh, and then uh, so he, he, and he talked with the uh, with, the, with, the, with the commander in charge, uh, and he, he, wanted, he came with like two boys, uh, two, two of his sons and two of his nephews, and he wanted them immediately recruited right there and added to the list to be taken for training as pilots. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I will read this, a general, one general from Warab. He said, a very grim general lost his cool and went ahead to lecture and questioned the director about how during the war, they used to capture vehicles, and in particular, the Toyota Land Cruiser pickup trucks from the enemy. And then here is the quote. These boys straight out from the cattle camps would learn to drive them in two days without math, uh, or without math this or physics that, leave alone seeing the inside of a classroom. I order you to recruit them. If anyone asks you, tell them I ordered you. 
Tell me, what is the difference between the Toyota truck and these planes of yours? Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is this, this gives you a taste of uh, of uh, of how this thing was. So the gen the gentleman there, he thinks that driving a Toyota Land Cruiser is the same thing as flying a plane. So you had like a bunch of people that were recruited and were taken to Ethiopia, only for all of them to be rejected and sent back to South Sudan because they were completely unprepared for anything. They couldn't even speak basic English. This was how sad uh, this situation was. And, 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 and you see here clearly uh, the same problem that we have talked about before, the problem of nepotism, the problem of corruption, uh, you know, people being recruited without engineering background, without mathematics background, without physics background, and to be made as a head of the Air Force. Uh, this was absolutely a horrific uh, situation. Now, the last chapter, this is chapter 10. Uh, this is uh, focusing on the SPLM, SPLA struggle for an ideological direction. Uh, and you know, this has been a key issue. And if you remember, if you even go back during the war, and uh, you look from the very beginning, even from the first problem between John Grang and the so-called politician, those of Odua, those of Majergai, and others, these were the issues, the issues of ideology, the issues of organization. Because you are managing people, you are managing a system. It requires organization, it requires being thought out. And what happened all the time? These people were savagely killed. You remember with what happened with uh, Joseph Oduo, what happened with those of, uh, uh, those of uh, Akona Tim, those happened with uh, those of Makura Leo uh, and others. They were victimized and they were killed because they were advising how a professional organization can be run. And our people in the SPLM were not thinking. They were only concentrating on power. And they wanted power for themselves. And they were not thinking about how can they build an organization that can truly unite the people of South Sudan and allow them to achieve what they are fighting for. You know? So people were always victimized. Those who came with ideas on how to improve things, they were victimized. They were killed. And they were, they, 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 they were severely uh, attacked and destroyed. And these were patriots of South Sudan. They were labeled as if they were, they were traitors. But the real traitors were the one that prevented uh, the organization from being built professionally. You know? and, 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 and these people entrenched themselves in the power. They used the military intelligence. They used all kinds of things, all kinds of ways to prevent the movement from professionalizing. And, and, and this is a problem that has continued to haunt us since they, those days. Uh, and you, know, you, you find it here in, in this chapter. You know? Uh, you know, there we were so-called, there were uh, communists, and then the communists, the communism didn't work, so then we tried to move away from that. Uh, the, we were highly militarized structure in the form of the so-called political military high command that never even met until Riyak Machar uh, had to defect from it. No one single time did they call a single meeting until the crisis of 1991 came in. Uh, this was the problem. The issue of what is the objective of the war. Uh, you know, Grang defined this United Socialist uh, Sudan, which essentially became the new Sudan vision. And then there was the problem of others who wanted more to fight for separation, so that is clear what the objective is. Those discussions never happened. A and indeed, thank you, Brother Daniel Deng, one of the other great men of South Sudan that was victimized and that was killed was, Dr. was uh, Benjamin Bola Cook, And he was among the very first South Sudanese to graduate from Oxford University. Uh, I know uh, it doesn't matter where one goes get, get his education from, but uh, going to Oxford, uh, even now, uh, is not a walk in the sky. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy. This was a brain of South Sudan. And these people were killed by illiterate people, people that were completely had no idea, that could not do anything whatsoever. You know, so, uh, Oh, since day one, the movement has been eating its own children. It has been killing the best and the brightest uh, within its rank and only promoting loyalists, uh, matokra. These are people that only clap their hands and they sing praises and they sing oyes and they don't want to d deal with the right thing, even when it came to professional military organization. Look at those of Arong Thon Arok. They were victimized. Arong Thon Arok uh, was among the brightest military officers that were in the movement. But these people, they were collided, and they were basically uh, attacked. Uh, and the military intelligence that was headed by Salva Kiir was busy cooking up conspiracies uh, so that the people are turned against themselves and kill one another. And that's why you end up with a movement full of people that could not 
think about anything and could not make any plans. Uh, but there is a very fascinating chapter here. And you, know, you have to give SPLA also the due credit. The so-called vision of New Sudan, although it was vague, uh, you will see as I read this, uh, and this came by the way, uh, the Tim, Tim Edwards here is, is quoting uh, Stephen Wundu. Uh, it came from like excerpts uh, of, 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 uh, of, of Tim Wundu, uh, of, of uh, Stephen Wundu, uh, who was talking about the vision of New Sudan, and he was quoting John Grang uh, from his book. So uh, here, this is John Grang that is talking. He's saying, by advocating for a united New Sudan, we are presenting ourselves as nationalists who will rid the country of past injustices and unite the Sudanese people around a common sense of belonging. We are saying that Sudan belongs to all of us, whether you are a black or brown, Arabs or African, Muslim or Christian. These diversities need not be a source of conflict as they are today. This strategy opens door everywhere in the world. Who does not want to listen to people advocating unity, democracy, and justice? It also deprives the regime of valid counter arguments. How can they chastise, and they here is referring to Riyak Machar and Lama Kol after they defect. How can they chastise us for saying we are fighting to save our country from disintegration? And then the quote continued. There are some parts in the middle there. You can go through it on your own time. But towards the end, he come back again to, to this. I say, the new Sudan approach can also be used as a tactical maneuver by those who are advocating for secession. Let the ardent Arab Islamists who have ruled the Sudan since independence in 1956 tell us why it is logical for us to remain part of a country which describes itself as Arab and Muslim when we, we, then when we in the South are neither Arabs nor Muslim. Sudanese p unity can only be sustained if we all accept ourselves as equal owners of the country. Let the rulers of Sudan choose between the Arabism and the unity of the country. We are fighting to make the point they cannot have both. It is unattainable. As for our brothers in Nasser faction, I would say it makes no sense to announce a coup in Nasser against someone sitting in Torit. We have no government, uh, physical structure to be captured. We have no government for someone to overthrow. All we can do is disagree and live in different corners of the bushes of southern Sudan. And then he continues here, and this will be the last part that I will read. The objective of the movement has been used as the excuse for the Nasser betrayal. I know as much as they do that South, fe that South feel strongly about its quest for independence. These are valid reasons for their wish, but the strength of passion is not the same as the practicality of the proposition at this time. We must base our approach on the objective realities facing us. The National Islamic Front has dropped the hint that they would be ready to let the South break away if the Nasser uh, group removed John Garang and abandoned the call for New Sudan. A little thinking could have made our brothers realize that the NIF was being as typically deceptive as their predecessors. When Southerners demanded a federal system as the condition for supporting the independence of Sudan, the Arab promised them due consideration. That promise was contemptuously disregarded after independence. Do we have to repeat the same mistake in 1991? Why would the government see territory to them after the successful destruction of the SPLA? The very fact that the NIF detests the concept of New Sudan confirms that we have touched the right button. We want a united, democratic, secular Sudan. They prefer a theocracy, which by definition is dictatorial. But without secularism and democracy in a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious and multi so many things Sudan, unity is impossible. The Nasser announcement has more to do with power than the destiny of the South. Power struggle is not the same, is not the same thing as liberation struggle. Let us liberate ourselves first. The rest will follow. And by the way, uh, you can see this, uh, this, this, this argument was a winning argument because Gang there was putting a real logic that to, to achieve your objective, the vision of New Sudan was necessary. And the problem became how then you allow the vision of New Sudan to exist with the demand f and the uh, genuine desire for independence so that you can build institutions that will then allow you to have that independent country. And that is where the problem was. But you can see here also the logic in John Grang. John Grang is fighting for the vision of New Sudan. And the Nasser faction said that Grang was wrong. And even if they felt Grang was a dictator and they could not work with him, there was no reason why they could not then fight the enemy on their own. 
Why then turn their guns on John Grang, who is also uh, someone who is uh, fighting for independence, of, or, 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 who is fighting the enemy, the same enemy? After all, the independence would have to come from the enemy. It, it would have to be uh, obtained from the enemy by defeating the enemy. Riyak Macha and Lama Kol could have just attacked uh, other areas uh, like Malakal and go on with their fighting. And the two movements, uh, although they may uh, separate, they didn't need to fight themselves. Why make a war of the South against the North to become a war of South with itself? That was the same mistake the SPLA made with the Anyanya in 1983. The first bullet was fired by the SPLA against the Anyanya, against those of Gaitut and those of Akwada Tim. And it's because they felt that those people want uh, independence. And they, as SPLA, want to fight for the vision of New Sudan. And if that was the case, why not let them fight the enemy? And then also the SPLA fight the enemy. Why fight them? And you remember, when uh, Bill Farm was attacked, it was the forces of 104-105 uh, uh, battalion uh, that attacked them under the leadership of William Nguyen. Why? They are fellow southern, uh, Southerners. If you disagree with the objective and the strategy of fighting a common enemy, why not do it on your own and leave them to do it on their own? And what is fascinating about this is also remind me of the attacks that I have been facing from other South Sudanese that call themselves opposition. They say they are opposition, and I wonder what is it that they are opposing. They are attacking me that I have attacked the personality of a leader. And what they don't understand here is personality of leader is important to how leadership is exercised. You cannot have a guy who is a thief, who is a drunkard, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is practicing witchcraft, uh, who is a murderer, you know, and who is a sex maniac. Uh, to be a leader, and you say you don't want those things to be pointed out, unless if you agree with those immoralities. So personality here is an issue. But even if you say they have a point, and they say I have not attacked or I'm not doing the opposition against al the right way, why then should they then come and attack me when we have a common enemy? Why not they attacking the enemy the best way that they think that the battle can be won? Why then go and leave the enemy which we are all fighting? Why not allow them to attack it in the best way that they can attack it? Why are they then coming to attack me? And this was the problem with the Nasser faction. They left the enemy and then they came and attacked Garang. If Garang was being dictatorial and he was not managing the movement in the right way, and if Garang was uh, fighting for the wrong objective, and they said, okay, we are leaving Garang. Okay, fine, that is reasonable, I can accept that. Why not then leave Garang? and then go and form your movement, but then fight the enemy the best way, with the best objective, organize yourself in the best democratic way that you think you can organize yourself, and then fight the enemy. Why then come and fight an ally who is also fighting the same enemy? And that is the same place that I am in today. People are attacking me, people who call themselves opposition. Yeah? Instead of attacking Salva Kiir, if they think my strategy of trying to take down the regime of Salva Kiir is not correct and is not winning, why not leave me to deal with my strategy and then they start their own Facebook program? I'm, I, I'm not limiting them from engaging in Facebook or going on the media. Why not them then start their own program, articulate with the people of South Sudan the best way to then attack the government? Huh? Why then are they busy being on my neck? And they claim that we have the same objective, which is to remove self care. Why not they, they do it in the best way with the best strategy so that the South Sudanese people will say, okay, we should support these guys. They have a better approach than BR. But instead of doing that, they go and st forget all of that and then they come to attack me. Yeah? It's like we are in a wrestling and we are trying to take down the enemy. And if I have grabbed the guy uh, uh, you know, in his battle, I'm trying to take him down, and they think that grabbing a guy in the battle is incorrect, why then they don't go and grab him in the leg or in the hand or in the shoulders so that we take him down? Why then come and remove my hand from where I have grabbed the guy and I want to bring him down? That was what the Nasser faction did. And that is what prevented us from achieving our objective uh, in the shortest time possible. And that is the same thing that these so-called opposition are doing. And that actually reveals that these people are not real opposition. They're just afraid that I am being effective and the South Sudanese people are rallying against my strat around my strategy. They're, 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 they're rallying uh, for me, around me, uh, and they want to support. They see what I'm doing is effective. So they became afraid of that. It was the same thing with Garan. 
despite all his problem and his organization, he was effective. He was capturing territories. And people was, were, were afraid that he was going to succeed. So the, it became about undermining him, preventing him from winning. And that is the same thing that they are trying to do to me. These people, they are rallying. Instead of them attacking our common enemy, which is Salva Kiir, who has destroyed the people of South Sudan, who has prevented the struggle of the people from succeeding, they are coming to attack me. It just shows that their interest is suspicious. These are not people that are real opposition. These are opportunists that want to endear themselves to the enemy, the same way that elements of the Nasser faction later on ended signing the sham Khartoum peace agreement, and then they went to uh, surrender themselves in Khartoum, only for them later on to return to John Garak. So do not worry, uh, compatriots. These people will return back to us because we are the true champion of the people of South Sudan, and we are the one with the real strategy that is geared toward removing Salva Kiir from power. These are the chapters that we have discovered, we, we have covered today. Uh, I just want uh, people to understand uh, this is what is in the book. We will continue. Uh, I ask you to then go and uh, analyze it in, on your own ways and assess this uh, in the correct uh, way. Uh, and then also uh, look at it from your own angle. Uh, there's a lot there that should humble ourselves. We should not be afraid when we say the SPLA had done wrong thing in the, in the bush. We should not be defensive. Uh, the SPLA was run by our people. Uh, John Grang is my uncle. Uh, we come from the same sub-clan, uh, and I'm proud of him. But also, he made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and uh, I cannot every time defend him simply because we come from the same village. The same way that I see some of my rake brothers uh, from uh, Gugliel and Tony uh, always having heart attack uh, when they see Salva Kiir being uh, criticized. Don't look at him as your uncle. He's a national figure. And we all of us, we deserve to criticize him and to point out his weaknesses. Uh, and South Sudan belongs to all of us. If he is just simply your elder or your leader, take him to your village. I keep saying, take him to Akun, take him to Warab. That is where you can keep him. And if you take him there and you find me again coming to criticize him, you will have a point. But if he is a leader and a president of the Republic of South Sudan, and I am part of the Republic of South Sudan, you need to understand that I have every right to criticize him. So people of South Sudan, you can see, the problem we are in has been in the making for many years. But of course, Salva Kiir has been part of that problem from the very beginning, and he has been using this politics of division and the militarism to entrench himself and prevent the people of South Sudan uh, from moving forward. Uh, so my people, uh, those of you who consider yourself opposition, if you think my approach is not correct, well, do your own approach. We have the same agenda, that is to remove Salva Kiir. Do your thing, organize it better, do it in the best way so that people of South Sudan rally around you. And let me do my things. Let me do my thing how best I can do them. Uh, instead of you coming to attack me and claiming that we have the same objective. If you are just Matograp, well, then it becomes clear that you are Matograp. But if you are a real patriot, you will be doing your things your own way and you leave me. We have to speak the truth and we have to show the failures of Kiir. It's not just only because of his inability to manage the country well and come up with policies uh, and procedures uh, that can take the nation forward but it's also primarily because he's personally unfit. Uh, the man is, uh, is of a weak, dubious character. Uh, as we have keep on uh, mentioning, uh, his personal life has set a wrong example for the country. He has allowed corruption uh, to take over. Uh, the guy is corrupt, he's a kleptomaniac, he's a thief that is uh, addicted to stealing resources, and that is why you see today, even the soldiers are not paid. Where is the money gone? Just the money that came uh, this month. $93 million was taken by Bull Mill. Bull Mill took it. And then you saw, you know, that, uh, that medical allowances where Deng Wall was given $150,000 and some of the officers there, $100,000, you know, $90,000 and all of that money. This was just, you know, to kind of like make them look the other way. Uh, these are not the real people stealing the money. The money is being stolen by Bull Mill through ARC. This is why... <coughs> The soldiers don't have money. And do you know what he does with the money? He pays the tiger, not the whole tiger, by the way, the tiger that is inside J1 and J2. They are paid off the book by Bull Mill. The rest of the tiger that is in uh, Gyada, they get nothing. You know? So even within the same unit, people are not being treated equally. 
some elements are being paid, other elements are not being paid. You see, this is, it shows you, this is the same, this is what we have been talking about. This is the problem that we will, we, we have been talking about throughout. So we cannot allow that. We have to speak the truth. Those soldiers deserve to be treated equally. So imagine, Bulmil is paying the tiger inside the compound. The tiger in Geda is not being paid. The rest of the soldiers, they're just busy cutting down trees and burning charcoals. And that is destroying the environment of South Sudan. Now, the only way people are surviving, they're shooting the wildlife. You saw the picture of the guy that was arrested in Nimali, uh, who, was, uh, who had just killed an elephant. Why did he have to kill an elephant? Because he had to feed his family. And what is that doing? It's destroying our wildlife. Those animals, if we were to change the leadership today and build a real country, do you know what is going to happen? We will build one of the most effective tourism sectors. Rwanda, a very tiny country with nothing. They have only 50 gorillas. Generate hundreds of millions of dollars a year through tourism. We have amazing diversity in wildlife. We have amazing vegetation. But because of the poverty that is being imposed on the people of South Sudan by the corrupt, murderous regime of South Kiev, now South Sudanese are being forced to destroy the environment. Trees have been cut down. Animals are being killed. You know, and we are taking away resources from the future generation. We are leaving our nation in poverty and in debt. We cannot allow that. So we have to call out. And we have to call out not just only the failures of the policies of South Kiev, but call them out on his personal life. Because that personal life set an example. That is why today in National Security Service, every single office has a bed. Because Salva Kiri is busy bedding young girls. Now everybody from Akolokur down to all the officers in the NSS are also busy bedding uh, young women. And, and they're having sex with them. And they're doing all kinds of terrible things with them. You know? and, they, and, 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 and in a country that is dealing with like, problems of HIV, you have leaders that are spreading it. This is horrible. We cannot allow that. And we have to speak about that. And if someone complained that the elder has been in, insulted, we cannot accept. He's our president, and we have a right to point out where he's going wrong. The same way that I allow you to point out how I'm going wrong. Do I go, go, go mad when many of you criticize me, although most of your criticism are unfair? No, because it's your right. I have a right to, to criticize the president. So we cannot have a kleptomania, a sex maniac, a drunkard, a, a witchcraft practitioner, and a murderer in the office as a leader, setting the example for the country. We need someone with a better values, someone with a, an agenda, with a vision for the country to take the nation forward. So let me uh, stop there. And uh, I could not translate the whole thing into Dinka today. I, we don't have time, and I don't want to take too much of your time. But I will make an, a special uh, program on Monday uh, where I will uh, do what I have done today in Dinka so that those of you who can speak uh, we speak Tongmanjang, who don't understand English, will have a chance to also understand what I have covered in those four chapters. Let the conversation continue. Make your own videos. If you want to make your own videos, do so. If you want to write a comment, do so. Whatever you want to do is fine. If you want to attack us, it's fine. You want to do what is, is fine. But the conversation has to continue. Uh, thank you, my people. Please share the video. We encourage all the people of South Sudan to join this conversation because 2024, we are taking our country back. We are getting rid of Salva Kiir and we are putting in place a government that can take the people of South Sudan forward. God Almighty bless you. Have a great weekend and I will see you on Monday when I will do the same program that I have done today in Tongmonjang. God bless you and see you.